Welcome to the Six Five Summit. I'm Shelley Kramer, one of the founding partners here at Futurum Research. And on behalf of my team here at Futurum and the team at More Insights and Strategy, we're so glad to have you. In this spotlight session, Futurum's Daniel Newman is joined by Samsung Semiconductor Corporate Senior Vice President of Memory Sales, Jim Elliott. And they're going to talk about the critical role that memory plays in supporting what has quickly become our new normal. Jim also shares how memory will be a key toward keeping the world moving forward in a post-pandemic environment. I don't know about you, but this is one conversation I am very interested in. Let's get to it. Jim Elliott, welcome back to the 65 Summit 2021. One of the OGs, the original from the first event. We are so thrilled that you were able to return for this year's summit. OG, I love that. Thank you, Dan. I'm um, fired up to be here and uh, nice to see you remote, although I'd like to see you again in person, but uh, we're getting there. Tech Day 2026, when we start doing live events again, I'll be back. Well, come on. I'm more optimistic than that, but uh, yeah, I hear you. I hear in ya. fairness, I have a slate of live events for the fall. Um, I was even asked to be at Mobile World this year in uh, Barcelona. Yeah, yeah. I think they're doing is hybrid, but I'm tempted. I, I haven't decided for sure if I'm going to actually get on a plane or remote in. But, uh, you know, well, honestly, you've been, you've been I've got the travel bug, Jim. You know, like, man, so I think it's all good. Yeah, I'm, I'm fully vaccinated. I'm, 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 I'm ready to travel. So There you go. Right back at you. Well, listen, we'll have to do that. When we land in the same place, um, but for everyone out there, super excited that uh, we were able to get Jim Elliott back here tuning in. What a great day, Semiconductor Day. We have just a deep slate of, of just brilliant minds. You, of course, and I had the chance last year, right in the middle of the 2020 rise of the pandemic. Although at the right. time, I think we thought that was maybe the back nine. Um, we did. Let's, let's just kind of do a little trip down memory lane, and we'll start off by talking about kind of from the left off, left off point from last year, you know, the role of IT, semiconductor during the pandemic, big topic all over the media, tons of cycles. How is this dynamic playing out for you? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, as I recall, a year ago, I kind of led with a quote from the CEO of Microsoft, where he said, we've seen more uh, digital transformation in the last two months than we've seen in the last two years. And I think that's really continued, this whole so-called Digital transformation is now we've experienced over the last 15 months has been un unprecedented. And I think I really have to go back to the archives, Dan, for another uh, famous person's quote. And you know, it was the founder of AMD, Jerry Sanders. And he said in 1979, the, semicondu the semiconductor industry is today's crude oil. 1979, he said that. So I thought that was incredibly uh, prescient. And here we are today, 42, late, or 42 years later in 2021. You know, IT has been the backbone of industry, economy, uh, education, and even social life during, during the pandemic. But I think, Dan, what's interesting is those of us who have, have lived and breathed and made a career in semiconductors have kind of known how important semiconductors have been all along. But now I think this line of thinking has become much more fashionable, if you will. Yeah, I like that. Um this shortage, which has impacted everybody in everyday life, has certainly brought news media cycles to where, you know, if I brought if I brought semiconductors up at the kitchen table or the Thanksgiving dinner table like three years right. ago, people have been like, huh? What are you talking about? And, you know, then you'd be like, oh, you know, chips for your computer. I'm like, oh, chips like Doritos. I mean, people really didn't get it. But now because of, of, of visibility in the cycle, I mean, semiconductors is the thing. It may be the most popular tech topic. And I've, I've probably laid claim to this more than one time. So if you're listening to this session, it's not your first with me. I've said, you know, in 2020, the beginning of the year, um, I was I did some predictions right before COVID for MarketWatch. And I said, semiconductors will eat the world. You know, everybody kept saying software will eat the world. And I said, no, 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 no. You got to go one layer deeper, right? Because all that we're doing on software is enabled by semiconductors. Um, I did not know you know, I don't tend to admit when I'm wrong, but I tend to really brag a lot when I'm right. No, I'm there you sorry. go. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, I, but I think I got that one. Um, but, you know, your business focuses a lot at Samsung on, on memory. And, you know, technically adept people are aware of memory and its role. 
But I don't think everybody, you know, people kind of interchangeably think of semiconductors as sure. phones or PCs, but there's a lot of semiconductors. Kind of what's your, what are some of the things you wish people knew about memory and its role that you just don't think most people get? Sure. I, I think kind of as you go about your day-to-day routine in, in life or as a, as a student in, in, in professional life, personal life, and every device you touch, memory is critical to every computing device that you own. And during the past year, most of us have increased that number of devices that we own, whether or not it's for business use or, or personal use. You know, for example, on the device side, we've seen more PC adoption, more tablets, phones. You know, you couldn't travel or you couldn't get, take the kids to Disneyland. So people were buying game consoles, smart appliances, uh, et cetera. You know, verticals like healthcare, COVID research, use uh, need uh, incredible amounts of compute uh, and data storage and data crunching. And then infrastructure, all this connectivity, all these different devices needs that means there need, you need to have more servers, more data centers, edge computing, et cetera, to tie all this together. And so I think, you know, life as we know it during uh, the pandemic would have been completely different if IT weren't where it is today. I mean, think about it from 30 years ago, people would have had been sending faxes back and forth. And now all this connectivity, like this meeting too, for example, that we take for granted I think has really been enabled uh, by IT as the backbone and memory has to be able to support and help drive all that activity. Yeah, so much of that experience we have within our apps are driven by the access to the data, which by the way, requires memory. So, um, you know, I know we have a vast crowd, you know, we had a few million people watch our videos last year. So I'm sure some are extremely astute and they're like, yep, I know this. And other people are like, whoa, (laughs) I didn't know that at all. But Memory is a, a very, it's, 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 it's extraordinarily critical. Now, you mentioned healthcare. Um, this last year brought, you know, attention to semiconductors and a heck of a lot of attention to healthcare, uh, medical research. Both have been huge over the last year. Um, we've talked a lot about supercomputing, but talk a little bit about memory and the role it's had in all of this research and healthcare and, and everything that we're doing in the background, you know, using your technologies. Yeah, you know, a really great example is that is the COVID-19, uh, what we call the High Performance Computing Consortium. And this is uh, like a public-private initiative that consists of IBM, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and also the, the DOE. And this is all about just providing that free access to high-performance computing for things like virus research, genetic analysis, and even things like vaccine development. So obviously, these are all very timely topics. It basically utilizes supercomputing resources from private companies, national laboratories, and universities. And not to get too often into the weeds on on speeds and feeds, if you will, but this this initiative uses at least 600 terabytes of our new Samsung's new HBM2, which is high bandwidth memory, and that uh, serves up about 430 petaflops of processing power. So it's all at the end of the day, it's all about this massive amount of computing power that allows researchers to get the COVID-19 answers that they're looking for in hours or days, as opposed to in weeks or in, in months, because obviously time is of, of the essence in, in a pandemic environment. Yeah, and a lot of people probably felt like things didn't move fast enough, but the exponential pace, the, the vaccines are a great example. Multiple major pharmaceuticals and smaller pharmaceutical companies were able to take data, put it to research, uh, run clinical trials, identify compounds, and get products into production through testing and in market under emergency use authorization in different parts of the world, which, by the way, tons of different regulatory requirements for that in, what, a year, in about a year? Right. Um, and I think you and I just talked about that. I mean, we've, we've all been vaxxed, and those things were just kind of a figment of everyone's imagination, you know, less than 12 months ago. So Yeah, but, I mean, that's extraordinary. You know, and like I said, it felt sometimes like, oh, why don't we just put – the uh, RNA of the, the virus into a supercomputer? And why doesn't it just tell us which vitamin we can all take right. and right. not get sick? And, you know, it's not exactly how it works. Although, like I said, you know, as, 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 as computing continues to, to grow and scale, it'll get faster. It, believe it or not, as fast as it was, it will get faster. Now, right. you mentioned and you quoted Satya Nadella and, and Microsoft's been with us throughout this event. Yep. Always great to hear from Satya in tech intensity. And you mentioned his quote, two months and two years. And I've heard five years and five weeks. I've heard all kinds of variants of that quote um, over the last year. 
but you mentioned this and you mentioned there's so much other digital development. Um, it's changed the way we live. It's changing how our kids are going to school. It's changing how we socialize and, and maintain human contact. Where did memory fit into all of these behavioral changes and life changes we experienced? Yeah, so if you think about it, like the number of devices, uh, capabilities, services has, has all increased, especially in the last 15 months. And this could be online shopping, remote work, remote learning, you know, the, that sort of XFH or everything from home kind of an analogy. I mean, I remember when the pandemic first hit, we were doing Zoom happy hours with, with colleagues that you couldn't see again. And so the point there, though, as we touched upon is all that generates a tremendous amount of data. And so the amount of memory and the amount of data that's that's generated and consumed kind of goes hand in hand. You know, we've been talking about data for years. In fact, I think we talked about that a lot at last year's Six Five Summit. It seems like kind of a buzzword, but it really is kind of everything. You know, it drives HPC, it drives AI and machine learning, and and also it's kind of the part of that overall digital transformation that we've been talking about. So then take edge computing for example. So now the industry has to look at bringing the compute and storage closer to where the action is. There's literally so much data being created at the edge or through all these client devices that it becomes prohibitive to try to transfer back and forth. So really we have to bring that compute and storage capability closer to where the data is being um, created so it can be actioned upon. And that's where we get into things like that real-time compute for real, which is critical for real-time decisions. So really our role at the end of the day is, is to ensure the best and most efficient way forward for our memory customers and for the industry as a whole to utilize computing resources to support this data-driven um, world. So Samsung, from that standpoint, we're constantly thinking about driving memory innovation to support the client as well as host applications, but then it's all about the interoperability of the two. And so net-net, it's really up to the semiconductor providers, including the memory industry, to provide solutions that re reliably can store, protect, and then also make that data available in, in real time and accessible for real time business decisions. So I imagine though this has kept you pretty busy then. You know, what have you guys been doing to enable this? Yeah, we've no doubt we've been we've been busy for sure, even without commutes and without business travel, right? It's amazing how everyone has stayed uh, even I would say more busy in in this environment and you know data growth drives the need for things like high capacity ssds which is a big component of our business uh, compute uh, ai uh, artificial intelligence hpc needs things like high capacity dram as well as new and emerging products like hbm or ddr5 and then now you're hearing a lot about 5g connectivity and that needs a completely different type of memory like lp ddr for the best mobile experience including longer battery life and so Net net for a memory supplier, there's really not a one size fits all solution. So we're really going to have to innovate on multiple fronts. Yeah, and, and, and there certainly are a number of players, and Samsung's, of course, one of the, the, the global leaders, and you're seeing innovation and approaches to memory, uh, and each of you are, are taking slightly different. And by the way, like I said, this event, which is just has an amazing roster of semiconductor companies, uh -huh. you know, throughout it, you may hear different things as a, you know, as you, the audience from these different vendors, but I think every single one of these, whether, you know, it's DRAM or whether, you know, it's, you're talking about SSD, in some cases we're talking about, you know, persistent memory technologies and, and all of them play a role and all right. of you're developing them to try to address different needs, different applications, di you know, uh, different uh, compute architectures that are shifting. You know, you've got things that are super data intensive. You've got things that are, are, are much less intensive that require, you've got things that need access to data in real time, no latency, you got slower, longer latency. So I, I want to pivot here though, because we're talking to, you know, top execs like yourself, CEOs from a vast majority. We, we really do have the slate of semiconductor companies here and none of them are going to get off of our stage, virtually speaking, without being asked about the chip shortage. Okay. Uh, what's causing this? What's your story? Because, you know, uh, there are so many different, uh, you know, versions of the story being told, and I've told one. And, and I'll and I'll add one thing um, to this is that you know while the stories aren't the same, chip companies are doing great. I mean, I just went through the earnings wave, uh, you know, and these companies are hitting numbers consistently in most cases. So what's up with this? You know, balance of supply demand. What do you see? Sure. 
Sure. So, you know, I've been in the, in the uh, semiconductor industry for, for 25 years, and obviously there's been many, many cycles throughout the history of the semiconductor industry. And so if you think about it in that context, there's probably been more than a dozen cycles that I've been through in that context. This is a cycle two. Um, and it's not just semiconductors, though. It's I mean, you're talking you're here now. The big buzz on Wall Street is a shortage of workers in at the outset of the pandemic, it was home products and home cleaning products. And every industry has had to adjust to this, um, we call it like an, this exogenous event, which has strained uh, these sort of very complex and interrelated worldwide supply chains. And I think, you know, for me, as, as soon as I saw the news break on that, uh, on that cargo ship on the Suez Canal, right? So you got the, the aerial photo of the canal, and then you've got the, the, the cargo ship at a 90 degree angle to where it's supposed to go. And to me, that was kind of like the metaphor for the entire worldwide supply chain and logistics that every single industry has been experiencing. And I think when we look back at all the supply chain challenges that not just Semiconductor, but everyone has had, to me, that's kind of the, the, the visual embodiment of this, uh, of this uh, supply challenge that really that every industry has, has had. And so for us, you know, drilling down into semis and the memory, we've really had to main be remain nimble as a supplier, given all the demand fluctuations. I mean, at the outset of the pandemic, the forecasts for everything were, were very, very pessimistic, right? And, and in reality, it was quite the opposite, as we mentioned, because of the fact that IT sort of formed the backbone of people being able to navigate through the, the pandemic. And so I think, you know, short term, we have to make sure that we get our product mix right. So as we talked about just a second ago, there's a there's this proliferation of different end applications, and they all need a different kind of ingredient of memory or a semiconductor, depending on what the application is. Long term, we also have to make the appropriate technology investments that will allow the IT industry to, to innovate. So, you know, at the end of the day, Dan, it's our ability to be nimble on our feet, work with customers, but you got to have a dose of optimism and a little bit of a can do spirit here to try to navigate through this uh, as an industry. I think as a society, we've had to have a little optimism, just make it through the last eight, yes. 18 months. And, and I, I want to just address a couple of things you said. I mean, one is I believe that pessimism at the onset of the pandemic has actually been one of the biggest bottlenecks for a number of the, company, the companies and industries like automakers just thought demand was going to fall off. Sure. And, and so, you know, the fabs order ceased. They got moved to the back of the line. And then as the demand picked up, they couldn't get back to production because, you know, you can't just go from one process to another, you know, and, and these fabs are using all the wafers, all the capacity, all the time across all the different processes. So that was definitely one thing that, that, that you mentioned. Okay, so let's get personal for a minute here. What surprised you the most? Like you in your role in the spot in the business you are, what was your biggest surprise over the last year? You know, I, I think it was just, it was the little things, right? From a personal standpoint, it, it's just kind of how much we took for, we all took for granted in our pre-pandemic life, just seeing people face to face, going to a live sporting event or, a, you know, a music concert and it, simple things like a business trip or eating at a restaurant, uh, in-person learning. And I think if you boil it down, you know, humans always use technology and the capabilities that, that, that tech brings to try and improve our lives. And so for me, it was really incumbent upon tech and the IT sector to, to recreate as much of that in-person experience as possible in this new kind of a remote uh, universe that we lived in so that we could try to stay human. So from that standpoint, as we talked about earlier, what was surprising to me is, is the resiliency is the word I would use to describe the IT industry and how this resiliency allowed uh, on the back, on the shoulders of IT, allow the world, economies, educational systems, and our social lives to continue uh, and to continue on as, as normal as possible during during this pandemic. And so in that sense, I think the overall importance of, of IT was really uh, imprinted on a lot of people and, and re-imprinted on those of us that, uh, that live and breathe IT uh, every day. And so I think as now moving forward, as businesses, consumers, you know, ramp up spending, flocking to new devices to stay connected and, and get back that new sense of normalcy. Now IT and semiconductor and memory also are seeing as mission critical. But like I talked about earlier, to those of us in this in the industry, it's really been mission critical all along. Yeah. 
Uh, absolutely. And I, I could tell you every day I wake up and I think, you know, there were so many little things that came out of the pandemic that most of us will take for granted. You know, all of us are jonesing, you know, it, it's just such a great reflection of society's desire and people always wanting whatever they don't have. You're traveling all the time. You just want a nice week at home. You're home for a few months. All you want to do is get back on the road. You know, you go to all these, these, uh, you know, you know, whether they're cocktail hours, happy hours, lunch meetings, you know, you're going, I can't eat another meal out. I just want a home cooked meal or I can't do another one of these lunch and learns or whatever it is. And now it's like, I can't wait to see everybody in person yeah. again. I mean, it's just, it's hilarious though. But you know what, for me, and I know this sounds funny and maybe it's a little endearing. Maybe it sounds uh, like something you'd never hear from me because I tend to be very pro professional all the time on my social profiles. But it was just awesome to spend like almost two, two years now with my kids and, and my, my family, you know, like I watched my four-year-old now son like grow from like, you know, uh, three, four, now almost five. and like. I would have missed a lot of that. So, you know, it's funny. Like I said, hopefully, you know, all of us can look back just a little bit at this and, and find some good. In, yeah, in all trying of to it. optimize around not having a commute time or not having to travel and, and how to spend those hours. But yeah, it's it's certainly been an adjustment, hasn't it? We found And we found a lot of efficiencies. All of the companies did like, wow, we do not need to do these things live. Like there are things we can do. Mm -hmm. Video conferencing did not get adopted quickly, but I still think we'll go back a lot because I think it's the social condition. So Last year at our summit, um, let's just do a quick year recap and review, Jim. Let's go back and uh, from your perspective last year, um, you know, any big changes from what you said at this year at the event last year to this year? Yeah, I think, you know, the big thing is is there was a lot of uncertainty at the, at the front end of this thing. And like you said, I think we when we met last summer, we already thought we were on the back nine of the, of the pandemic. And here we are, you know, 12 months later, and hopefully now we're on the on, on the back nine, if if not the 18th. But I think for me, it was it was kind of inspiring to see, you know, the industry come together uh, and, and company wise, company wise, seeing seeing Samsung's various teams come together to to kind of rise up and, and meet some of these challenges. You know, we really had to step up as a company, as an industry, to cope with these these changes and shifts in demand. You know, I've seen a work ethic that's just been incredible, creativity, problem solving, getting around logistics. And so my perspective was, you know, wow, we're, we're really, I mean, the memory in the semiconductor industry is always um, very fast paced. But I think now the thinking is, you know, we're, we're, we're good at this. We, we got this. If we can get through 2020 as we did, and now as we're getting through 2021, you know, I think we can navigate our way through, through any challenges in the future if we keep up this uh, same kind of mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And, and by the way, very, very, uh, you know, pleasant to hear some positivity that comes out of this thing. Really so, so as we, you know, kind of come to the end here, okay, and as we wind this down, we've identified, you've done a really nice job of sort of talking about memory and really its role and how it's contributing and how it will. But, you know, let's put a little, let's put a little of your foresight glasses on here. I want, I want you to do a little prognostication in these last few minutes. What do you foresee from Samsung and the overall you know, memory industry? What's the next for innovation? You know, there's going to be a ton of focus on, on research and, and constant you know, innovation. And we're really working closely with our customers because they're also extremely adept and innovative and, and bring a new products to market. And we have to be right there with them. And I'm, I'm super excited about all the research that's in the pipeline right now. Um, just the amount, the breadth of products, the, the end applications that it's going to support, you know, from both the standpoint of business, uh, consumer, host devices, client devices, everywhere. Again, back to that sort of ubiquitous uh, uh, sort of footprint of, of memory on the, on the value chain. And I really do think that memory is going to touch every single uh, endpoint on the digital value chain uh, in the future. Our customers, as I mentioned, are going to be continuing to be amazingly uh, innovative. So truly, really how do we partner with them to help ensure that their visions come to life? And at the end of the day, we want to build the most reliable, highest quality products for every market. And that's really what's going to get us back to that being human, enhancing people's lives, getting us through pandemics, and ultimately uh, just improving our future. Absolutely. So 
final thoughts as we wrap up. One word to describe what, what's going to happen or to describe 2021. 2021. I've, I've got a bunch that I can think of for 2020, but you might have to, to bleep those out as I, uh, as I rattle through those. So 2021, I think it's all about, you know, I don't know if I can come up with one because there's a bunch, but recovery, resurgence, uh, rebound, revival. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll land on revival. All our words, but uh, I think uh, that's kind of the thematically of, of, of where I see 2021. Uh, for the industry and then hopefully for society at large and again let's just hope that we can all emerge from this pandemic uh stronger you know smarter and then also more connected to each other yeah absolutely you know what so many good words jim really really appreciate all the time that uh, you spent with us here at the 65 summit appreciate samsung's continued support and uh you know we'll see you hopefully at our summit next year in person even. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, now the pressure's on us. That's so, right. Um, listen, thank you, Jim. We'll see you later. Everyone out there, what a day. The semiconductor track, just full of great thinkers, great minds, great conversation. All the all of our sessions, all of the 6.5 Summit, though, are available on demand. So if you missed this, missed any part of it, feel free to catch it. Catch the session on demand. Catch other sessions all the other days. Stay with us. We appreciate you. We'll see you later now.